All right, can everyone here to quickly do that poll? Give another like 30 or so seconds. All right, so most people say they know what it is, um, but aren't, but yeah, aren't experts in it. Okay, that's good. Um, so then I'll probably go fairly fast through the early stages, but if I'm going too slow, uh, too fast, sorry, please let me know. Um, but yeah, since you're familiar with it, I'll probably go a little bit fast unless people tell me to slow down at the start. So just some context with works and problems. So the first problem is kind of a fairly traditional, typical dynamic programming problem. So you're given an array of integers, uh, of n integers, you want to select some of them, but you can't select two adjacent, two next to each other. And the question is, what is the maximum sum you can select? So example here, well, we could we could select like three, four, and two, for example, for a total sum of nine. Um, we could select, we could go five, four, two for a total sum of 11. I think we'll find that's the maximum. We can't select five and three though, because five and three are adjacent. Um, so in fact, the maximum we can select is um, five, four, five, four, and two for a sum of 11. And that's sample output and that's the explanation there. This second case here, um, there's some negative numbers. I think it's fairly obvious we'll never wanna select negative numbers um, because that's just it's pointless. So in fact, the solution is just to select the, the three here. Obviously we can't select the three and the two, and the three is the three is better than the two. So just to quickly go over the first problem for the person who just joined, um, you're given an array of integers. You want to select some of these integers, but they can't be adjacent. And the maximum sum you can select. So in this case, it's um, five, four, and two, and here it's just three. And the bounds on this problem and the number of integers up to two hundred thousand. So this means we need quite an efficient solution because there could be a lot of integers um, we're given. An input format is just n followed by the n integers, fairly simple. So some solution ideas. Um, the first approach many people take is try and come up with like greedy-ish solution ideas. So for example, we could take the biggest number if it isn't adjacent to something already taken. So just keep taking the biggest one if we can. Now, does this work? Any thoughts on that? Just keep taking the biggest. I think we'll find it will actually work on the sample cases. So take, keep taking the biggest, we'll say take five, then take four, we can't take three, then take two, and here we'll just take three, and then can't take two. So. The solution works on our sample cases, but does it work generally? Um, the answer is in fact, no. And this is one case it doesn't work for. So if we just took the biggest one each time, we would take three. But in fact, the best solution is to take these two twos like that. And so if you were trying to like in a contest, if you're like, I think this greedy might work, Try and come up with the worst case. It's like the worst case for this algorithm is, well, a bad choice prevent, like a, a maximum choice prevents other, other options. So then like surrounding a big number by two numbers that are almost as big as it, like this, for example, is perhaps quite a fairly obvious breaking case, I would think. And yes, in fact, that is the breaking case. So that doesn't work. Another solution is to alternate, take every second element and like try both options of that. That also fails. On um, this case here, we're going to take the two fives instead of like every second element will be five and then one. So again, these are two, these are two ideas, two solutions which um, don't work. And in fact, there are many other solutions like these we can come up with, perhaps more complicated ones. We could say, well, take the biggest one, but then sometimes don't, et cetera, et cetera. We'll find that these solutions, almost all of them will just not work, um, to put that simply. Um, we'll, we'll be able to find a way to break them. Um, we don't have time to you know, try a hundred of them, but 
if in your own time you have other ideas, feel free to share them in the chat and we're happy to see if we can try and break them. But moving on, there is a DP solution. So dynamic programming is the technique we're covering today and we'll explain DP through this example. So yeah, the key aspect is breaking down a problem into smaller sub-problems. Now that's kind of vague. So we'll jump straight into the solution. Let me define a function. So we'll, we'll say fi is the answer to the problem, that problem being the non-adjacent subarray sum, if we only consider the array um, from i to n. So we only consider some suffix of the array. As some examples, this is sample input here. f of six is just the maximum only considering the last element. So we ignore these ones, the gray ones. We just consider the last one. Obviously, the answer is just one. f of five, we consider this the last two things. The answer is two. f of four, f of four, there are two options. The answer is two in both of them, but there are two ways to achieve that maximum. This one and this one both lead to a maximum, both lead to a sum of two. Um, they're both optimal. f of three is six. Again, some more examples like this. I should make it fairly clear what f of i means. If you're unsure, let me know. But it's just the answer to the problem only considering some suffix. And obviously then, by definition of f of zero, f of zero is the answer to the original problem because f of zero is just the answer across the entire array, which by definition is a solution to the problem. And so how do we solve um, f of this f? Well, in fact, we can come up with a formula that, that depends on other values. How does this formula work? Well, consider like um, f of one here. How can we solve f of one? Well, there's two cases. Case one is we include the three. If we include the three, then we can't include the one. So the answer will be three plus the maximum subarray sum just considering the last elements because we kind of ignore one. It's impossible to take that if we take the three. So the answer then would be three plus f of three, which f of three being this one here. But what if we weren't going to take this three here? If we didn't take the three, then the answer would just be f of two because if we're ignoring the three, then the answer is just these, the maximum in that subway sum here. So case two is we don't take the three. And so the answer is f of two. So in fact, the answer is the biggest of these two. We want to maximize the answer. So it's a maximum of these two options is the answer to f of one here. In a similar way, the answer to f of zero is um, f of zero is a maximum of five plus f of two and f of one. And the same applies for everything else. So we have this kind of formula for finding the answer based on other answers. And that's why, D, that's why DP is so useful. And to formalize this formula, we have this thing here. So first of all, we're defining, to make it simpler for us, we're gonna define like f of seven, f of eight, et cetera, to all be zero. Um, this just makes it a bit easier to um, implement. So anything bigger than n is just zero. Otherwise, this is the exact formula I had before. Um, the maximum of we take the element or we don't take the element. Um, that, yeah, that, that is, yeah, that, that is the solution. That, that is the DP recurrence, record is the recurrence. So I can spell recurrence like that. Maybe it's got an A instead of an E, I'm not sure. Um, are there any questions about that? But this makes a problem quite easy to solve because computing this formula is very easy. We have like, we essentially just put this in code. And in fact, that's exactly what we do. Um, so next slide, we've just put this in code. This is just exactly what the previous slide says, but written in code. Um, and then we just call the function. We're just scanning the input here. That's just, um, so this is C++ if you aren't familiar with it. It's very similar to C. Um, this function here is like pretty much the same as if it was in C. The thing is just max is in the algorithm header and returns the biggest of two numbers. That's fairly easy. Um, and then this is just input the same as in C using scanf and this is print the answer. Um, that is a pretty easy solution to this problem. 
using DP. Again, if you have any questions about that, let me know. But then the next question is, what is the time complexity? So for those who have done 2521, I think that's covered. If you haven't, time complexity is just informally like how fast? Is it fast enough? Um, and let's look at it. Well, yeah, the function f of i calls f of i plus one f of i plus two. If we look back at our formula here, this function here, f of i calls two other functions. So if we look at, um, so we draw a tree, we'll have f of zero, we'll call f of one and f of two, but f of two, we'll call f of two, f one, sorry, f of two and f of three. f of two here, we'll call f of three and f of four. But f of three here, we'll call f of four and f of five. That's just, again, um, the branching the solution does. Uh, so f of, f of five. Um, f of two here, we'll then call f of three and f of four. And it just kind of repeats. We have this quite, this quite big tree here. It just keeps going down. And this is exponential because if we imagine if we have like n is quite big, like n is 100, you can imagine this will go down for a long time. And in fact, we can upbound the time complexity by two to the n. The reason is that every function calls like two other ones. And so we're going to like doubling each layer. In fact, um, we can make it a bit lower at this number here. Don't worry too much where that comes from. That's phi. Um, but that's a bit of math to prove that. We're not going to worry about that. The only important thing is this solution is too slow. And to kind of show why it's too slow, I'm going to well, show, show some code, show some examples. So this right here is that same code from before. I've got three cases. I've got a sample case here. So just run it on sample to make sure it works. It's compiled as M, run it on sample.in. It gets, um, where am I? Sample one dot in, sorry. Uh, I called it M1. M1? Yeah, it gets 11, the correct answer. And sample two, the correct answer is three, if you remember. Um, sorry, M1 on sample two. It gets three, which is the correct answer to sample case two. We've got these few bigger cases. We've got 40. So 40 is just, um, I can't actually view the top of my screen because of Zoom, but 40 is just, the test case which um for your in a test case which has 40 um n is 40. Run this on 40 dot in so this case here it it runs like takes uh, about a second or so to run not too bad run it on 45 this one has n is 45 our code is taking a lot longer to run um many seconds and it will eventually get the right answer um but it is quite slow yeah takes about like 10 seconds, I think. And then finally, if you run on like 300, it would like, we're gonna be here all day. We, we don't have time for that. It's exponential. And so it's gonna take, you know, a long time. Remember, end up at 200,000. So if we can't solve 300, then we can't solve 200,000 for sure. But there's one easy way to fix this. Every time we can see so in our tree from before, we have like, um, f of zero called one and two, one called two and three, two called three and four, et cetera. But every time we call two, we get the correct answer. We get the same answer, sorry. Like every call to f of two gets the same answer. So rather than calling f of two twice, how about the first time we find the answer for f of two, we just save it somewhere. And next time we call f of two, we just return our saved answer. In this case, our tree stops branching here. Instead, it looks like this and it looks like basically a line. And our solution goes from exponential to not being exponential anymore because each function is really only run once. And what does that look like in code? Well, here, I've added this done array here to mark have we done it yet. And we just say, if we've done it already, return our saved answer, memo, it's called memoization, this technique. Um, so return the saved answer. And here we just say done is true, we've done it already. And we just save the answer in this array here. So it just saves and returns the answer as such. And so this is a lot faster now. This is now, if we run this code M2 on like 40 here, it gets this great answer like instantly 45, 
300 just gets it like pretty much straight away. And in fact, on 200,000, it would get it like almost straight away as well. Um, we've now improved the speed from exponential to linear time just by saving our answer and not repeating ourselves, just by a small optimization. This is very, in DP, you have to do this. If you don't do this, your code will be exponential and you won't solve any problems. So memorization is a critical part of DP. You, you have to do it. You don't have a choice there. Except you kind of do. There is one other way to implement DP. This is recursive. We can code up the same code using a for loop. So here, I do the same thing, except I store DP in an array. I loop backwards from n minus one to zero. I just say DPI, and we look up the previous values in the array. And because we, got, we loop backwards, we guarantee that when we're calculating DPI, these two values here are already done. So we're doing the same thing as our recursive code. We're just doing it using a for loop, like such. And this kind of implicitly does the memorization for you. And so it's like the same time complexity solution. They're both, they're both correct, they both work. Um, and you'll find that like M3 also runs very quickly on these big cases, because again, it's also linear time. These are three different ways of writing the same solution. This one is too slow. Both of these are fast enough. So then back to um, the slides. So I mentioned memorization. That's just the same thing I said there. And there's that code that I showed you already. And then, so recursion versus iteration is what I just discussed. So iteration, recursion is when we have like a function and iteration is when we use a for loop. And yeah, in most problems, both recursive and iteration, they're both completely valid. So in this problem, they both work, they're both fast. Um, there are some cases where one is preferred over the other. So in problems where memory optimization are needed, and we'll have one of these problems later today, in those cases, iterative is generally better. So for loop based. In problems where there's many unreachable states, recursive is better because it won't visit those states. Um, those problems are kind of rare, but they happen sometimes. But in general, they're both usable. It's up to personal preference. And here is our iterative DP. Again, this is the code I showed you before. You've already seen it. We're just using a for loop. It's in the slides, so you can view it later, but um, that's not too important. Are there any questions about the first problem? If not, I'm going to move on to a second problem. Okay, let's move on to a second problem then. So it's called grid walk. So in this problem, you have a 2D grid of numbers again. Um, so you've got a grid, an N by N 2D grid. You start at the top left of this grid. So you've got a grid. You start in the top, so like this, I don't know. You start top left here. You don't go top right, but you can only walk down and right. So you can walk like this, for example. Um, this is one possible walk like this, or you can go like this or like this, but you can't go like up. So you can't do this red, you can't do this blue right here. You can't go like up. You can only go down and right. And each value has a number and your score is the sum of the squares you step on. What's the maximum walk from the top left to the bottom right? So example here. So one possible walk is this one with value three plus four plus two plus one plus four equals seven, nine, 10, 14, I think. Another walk is this walk here. Total sum of three plus one, take one plus one plus four, which gets us four, three, five, nine, I think. And there are not many other walks, but the best one is in fact, this walk here. We follow the red ones and we get a total score of 16. Um, seven take one is six plus 10 is 16. And that is the maximum score of any walk. So what the problem wants us to find. In this problem, N is up to 2000. So we have a 2000 by 2000 grid of numbers. And the question asks us to find the maximum walk in that grid. And it's just, just a score of it. So the input format is N followed by the grid. And output is just the maximum score.
This is again a fairly classic DP problem. So we're going to use DP here. Um, there are like solutions like trying to greedily walk, take, like do the best walk each time. These will all fail. And so I'm not going to show them now, but if you have any ideas that you think work, let me know and we can talk about them. But um, DP will work. And so our DP state now has two numbers. IJ, which is a position in the grid. We're, we're calling the top right here, zero, zero. This is zero, zero. And this is like two, two. It goes row column. So this will be like one, two here. Row, no, zero, zero, one, sorry, zero, two. Um, it'll be zero for the row and two for the column. So our grid numbering notation. And so we're going to say f of ij is the best, best path to the end from ij. So the answer is f of zero, zero by definition, the shortest path from the top left to bottom right. Um, if we go f of n minus one, n minus one, that'll be equal to the value at cell n minus one, n minus one. We're going to call we need this a notation a n minus one n minus one. We're defining as just the um, value at that cell. So the score from walking from the end to the end is just the value at the end. Obviously, that's how we define our f function here. So in this example here, um, f of this one here, so f of one one, will be negative one plus six plus four, for example, which is nine. F of this one here will be to go like this direction here. So f of 1, 0 here will be equal to 8 plus 4, 12, I believe. And we have a simple recurrence. First of all, for simplicity, we're going to define if we're outside the grid, we're going to say infinity. Because it's illegal to walk outside the grid. So you can say if you're outside the grid, the score is infinity. This just makes our code a bit easier to write. Um, there are like, so we just define those states as being infinity because they're invalid. Okay, then at the end position, the answer is just the value at the end because we can't go anywhere. So if we're, the, if we're at the end, the answer is just the value at the end. That's again, not too complicated there. Otherwise, the answer is the value at our cell plus the maximum of walking down and walking right. Because if we have a grid um, like, this, then we work out the answer here, for example, then this cell here is i j plus one. This one here is i plus one j. And so the answer is the value here, because we're going to start here, obviously, plus the maximum of our two options, either walk down or walk right. So our DP recurrence is just this. That's how we find the answer. And so um, the time complexity is n squared because it's n squared states. And the recurrence, this formula, is constant time to compute. So we have an order n squared time complexity if we use memoization, which we're assuming we use. And so in code, that looks like this. So again, we have our cases here, case one from the previous slide, case two from the previous slide. Then we do our memoization check. Then we do this one. Now, our memorization check could occur before these two if statements, but because these if statements here don't use any recursion, it doesn't matter whether we memorize before or after them. Memorization only matters if we're going to do further recursion. So it matters in before here. And then this is just a formula from the previous slide, which is precisely this formula here, but in code. Now, the answer is f of zero, zero. So we scan the input and we print the answer. And that is just this problem. So it's a nice, again, another simple DP. If there aren't any questions, I'll move on to the third problem, which is knapsack, which is um, a harder problem, but again, one that is fairly well known, I think. So you have knapsack, you have N items. Each item has a weight and a value. You have a backpack that has a weight limit of W. So you can put items into your backpack until they get to the weight limit. The question is, what is the maximum value of items you can fit in your backpack without exceeding the weight limit? Each item can be put in only once. The input format is N and W on the first line, and then N lines each with W and V. 
So for example, so our weight limit, um, get the eraser. Our weight limit here is 10. The number of items, N is four. And then this is the weight of the item here. This is the value of the item here. So we can't fit every item into our bag because the total weight is four plus three plus six plus two, which is 15, I think, which is too big to fit in our bag. But for example, we could put these two items in our bag for a total weight of nine and total value is five. Another option would be to put um, this item and this item in our bag. Their total weight is four plus six equals 10. The total value is six. But the best answer is to put this item, this item, and this item in the bag for a total weight of nine and a total value of seven. So the output is seven. And yeah, the explanation is we take the first, third, first, second, and fourth items, sorry, for a total weight of nine and total value of seven, which is the best we can do. Okay, if there aren't any questions about that problem, we'll move on to, um, so constraints, N is up to 2,000 and the weight up to 5,000. And onto the solution now. So the solution to this problem, um, so our DP state, that is like what our DP is, we need to consider two things because the weight of the items are important, but also, each item can only be taken once. And so somehow we need a state that considers both the current weight of the items and also which items we've already taken. Now, we can't, we're not gonna store exactly which items are taken, but we're gonna store which items we've selected from because that's a bit more efficient. So our state will be DPIW, that's lowercase w, not uppercase w, where I here, is the map is the items we've chosen from. So we've chosen out of zero to I minus one. And W is the total weight of items we have chosen. And then obviously DPIW is a value. So in the previous example, in, in the sample case here, DP zero any zero zero just zero because zero means you've chosen nothing because remember it's it's up to i minus one and we're going to zero index c so we're going to go number them from zero so dp one of zero so the total value if we have one item item one with weight zero that, that's zero whereas dp one four says we've chosen from the first item the total weight is four. What's the value? Well, the value is going to be three. DPI of like five, for example, is going to be zero because there's no way of having a total weight of five considering just the first item. Whereas um, DP2, that's the first two items. DP2 of, of four is going to be three. DP2 of three is two. Let's just take the second item. And DP two of seven says we've taken out of the first two items and our value is seven. The answer, the weight is seven, sorry. So the answer is five, et cetera, et cetera. So obviously the answer then is um, the maximum out of DP and zero or DP and W. Because DP and big, big W here, DP and big W is if we've chosen out of all n items and our total weight is w. But obviously our weight has to be less than w or less than or equal to w, sorry. So dp and w minus one is also valid if our backpack weighs w minus one, which in the previous example it did. So the answer is a maximum out of kind of all dp values with n equals n. So in this case, we're gonna use a forward pushing dp. There's a bit of nuance here. So in our previous DPs, we've used backwards DP. We've calculated the value of a state based on previous states. So for example, we've said f of i is equal to like 
I don't know the maximum of like AI plus F of I plus two, F I plus one. We've calculated the current state based off previously calculated states. This is called a backwards DP. In a forwards DP, you calculate the result of future states based on current states. Um, generally, a DP can be forwards or backwards. Both work. It's a matter of which one's simpler for the problem. So this problem, I think a forward pushing DP is a bit simpler. But how does it work? Um, and it only works for iterative DPs. You can't forward push for for loop based DPs. It doesn't make uh, with recursive DPs. It doesn't make sense. So how does a forward pushing DP work? We have an array. Initially, each DP IJ, this should be IW, just um, to, to use consistent notation, is set to negative infinity. Um, just, to, just to say we don't, have a, we don't have an answer yet, except DP 0, 0, which is 0, because that says weight of 0, chosen nothing, answer is 0. We, we loop over states in order, and we guarantee when we process a state, we already have this correct answer. So rather than calculating the state at that state, when we reach a state, we, we have the kind of precondition or the um, uh, invariant um, that the value is correct. And we update all future states like this. So we're gonna say, um, we're gonna update. So we're at DPIW. So we're at DPIW. And we update the value of dpi plus 1w based upon our current state. And dpi plus 1w, well, case one is if we don't take anything. Oh, so we don't take, if we don't take item i, then dpi plus 1w is the same as dpi w, because dpi w is we've chosen out of the first i items. dpi plus 1 is we've chosen out of the first i plus 1 items. If we don't choose i, they're the same thing. And so we update the future state with the maximum of its current value and this new candidate value. We also update the future state if we were to take this item. If we, if we were to take item i, then this new state, dpi plus one, with we now include the new weight here because we've taken another item. So we add that weight to our total weight. So total weight is now our current total weight plus our new item is the maximum of its already existing value here. And this new value, which is our current value plus the value of the new item. This represents if we take, if we add this new item to our backpack, then our total value is our current value plus the new value. That's where this comes from. And so by the time we process this state, we would have, all, we would have had the correct answer. Um, again, let me know if you're confused by this, but this is, it's a bit, can be a bit confusing, but it's a similar idea to a backwards DP. We're just kind of reversing the roles. We're now updating future states, still a DP. Um, you can rewrite this as a backwards DP. Um, that's an exercise. I'll let you do that yourself. But um, there are some reasons for a forward DP. And the answer is just a maximum of, I said this before, just maximum of all these values here. And in fact, I should include DP NW. This is a, I'll fix a typo later. Let me just, I'm going to fix that typo. It should also include NW here. I'll fix that for the uploaded slides. Also, there's two typos on the slide, this one here as well. Okay. This should be W. Okay. Time complexity is order NW because it's order NW states. And we do order one work at each state. That shouldn't be too bad. Um, this last step is a bit of a, um, a bit of a leap. And one of the reasons why we use the forward pushing DP here, we can improve our memory usage. Instead of storing the state, notice that this recurrence here essentially says the value on DPIW is kind of, because initially, right, DPIJ is negative infinity, which means this step here is always going to change the value of this new state to our old state. So here we're kind of saying dp i plus one w is equal to dp i w. 
because this step will probably happen later. So we're essentially saying that. Because of that, rather than using a new array index, why not just ignore this step and just use DPI and ignore J from the array here? Use memory usage. We saw DPW said DPIW. We still loop over every state. It's just that memory usage at any point in time, this memory array represents DPW. DPIW for the current I in the for loop. I think it'll make more sense when I show code. Um, one final thing, we have to iterate backwards or, or it wouldn't work. I'll explain that when we have the code in front of us. So the code is here. So notice that, um, so we initially set everything to negative infinity. Um, this code doesn't actually do that. Um, Although you'll find that implicitly that's actually not required. It, it still works um, regardless, but you can imagine that's everything negative infinity in here. In fact, leaving it at zero um, doesn't change anything because of the fact that implicitly everything gets, gets at zero anyway. But don't worry too much about the negative infinity set. Just worry about this in the loop here. So we iterate over all i's. That's the i in our state. So this is the i in our state. Then we iterate over the weights backwards. And then we just, we just check, first of all, can we add a new weight to our backpack? If so, this is just precisely the second one here. That is precisely this, this, that is precisely this, this check here. We're just going to update the future state based on our current state. And this first update happens implicitly because of the way um, our array storage works. Now, why do we iterate backwards? Well, if we iterated forwards, then let's say the first item had a weight of one. If we updated forwards, then DP zero would update DP one, but then DP one would update DP two. And our DP would allow us to take the first item as many times as we wanted to. See if we had a modification of our problem where each item we have infinite of, this would work. But because each item we only have one of, if we iterate backwards in this inner loop here, then because each DP only updates higher weight values, we don't run into that same problem. So it's fine. Okay. So this, that just works like that. Okay, and again, the answer is a maximum across all of these um, different Ws, DP of, this is again, DP of N, W using our previous, um, using our previous notation. Does that make sense? It's a bit, it's a bit confusing how this code works, um, but it's just using a push forward DP plus a memory optimization in order to work correctly. If there aren't any questions, um, I'm going to move on to the final problem for today, which is a different, a quite different problem. It's not a classical problem, so probably similar difficulty in knapsack, but it's a different, yeah, it's a different problem. So how does that problem work? So it's palindromes. In this problem, you're given a string of characters, so S, so S could be like A, B, C, D, for example, if N equals four. Um, take note of the one indexing here. We start at one this time. In each query, you're given some range. And the question is, how many palindromes are in that range? So how many substrings in a range are palindromes? Palindromes are the same forwards and backwards. So as an example here, this first query says, how many palindromes are in this range here? Well, it's one. A letter is obviously a palindrome. One letter is a palindrome. What about one to four? What well, says use the first four letters here? Well, there are four palindromes, C, A, A, A. So we count a palindrome twice if it appears twice. Then two letter palindromes, A, A is a palindrome. And there are two occurrences of A, A here and here. Then finally, 
A A A is a palindrome. The three letter palindrome. So there are seven palindromes in this range. What about um the range four to six here? Well, there are four palindromes. A B and A is a palindrome, but also A B A is a palindrome. It's the same forwards and backwards. So the answer to the queries are um so we answered these ones by hand. Again, an explanation of the final of the la of the fourth query. The answer is four because there are these four options. There is A, which occurs from four to four, B, A again, and then A, B, A. So yeah, we count a palindrome twice if it appears twice. And so for each question, so the, this, the input format is the string followed by the number of queries followed by the queries of the form LR. So the constraints, the bounds, the string, the length of the strings up to 5,000, but the number, the number of queries is much bigger. It's up to a million. So we have to be able to answer queries efficiently, but we can do like an N squared solution or something. That works because N is 5,000. N squared is 25 million. That runs in. The time limit was actually five seconds for the original problem. So we have a bit, we have a little while to run. And we can answer each query, we have to answer them all efficiently. So, if, that, if there aren't any questions about the question, how do we solve the problem? Well, first of all, we're going to solve a different problem, which because it'll, it'll become in handy. How do we know if a substring is a palindrome? So if I give you the string like A, B, C, B, A, how do you check that is a palindrome? But for example, A, B, C, B is not a palindrome. Well, one way is just to read it forward and backwards and check if they're the same. Another way is to compare the first and last character then these two, then this of itself. So we compare like first and last, then second with second last, and check they're all the same. Because the string is the same forwards and backwards, and the first and last one are the same. Second and second last are the same, etc. Now, if we check this for every substring, it'll be too slow. Because there are n squared substrings, because there are n start positions and n positions, and each one is n in length. So the overall complexity of checking every substring on its own is order n cubed, which is too slow. Okay. Um, are there faster solutions than that? The answer is we need to do a DP solution. So we, we define is palindrome ij to be true if the substring is a palindrome. First of all, if i is equal to j, it's true because every one letter word is a palindrome because it's the same forwards and backwards. That's, yeah, that's nothing, nothing to that really. If the length is two, so if we have a, a, a string of length two, then a string of length two is a palindrome if and only if both letters are the same. So the string is of length two, we just check that it's like form AA and not like BA, for example. Finally, if the string is longer than length two, then let's say it's like, a, B, C, B, A, palindrome, whereas A, B, C, C, A is not a palindrome. We first check start and end of the same. In both cases, the answer is yes. But then we check, okay, we can remove first and last characters. And in a palindrome, if we delete the start and the end, the middle will still be a palindrome. So our DP says, check the start and end of the same, and then check that the middle string is also a palindrome. And so this one will say, yes, this one will say, this one will go, okay, these are the same, then check the middle again. This one will say, oh, these aren't the same, so the answer is no. So this and condition, we wanna check that the start and end are the same and um, the middle is a palindrome. The complexity is order n squared because there's n squared states and order one recurrence, which I said before is fast enough to check palindromes. Okay, so here is um, the code for that. So we're doing a, a, a um, for loop based DP. And in our for loop based DP, um, we have to loop over the string, the states in order of length. That's because in a DP, this is, this is a forwards, this is a backwards DP again, back to our backwards DP from before. And in a backwards, in a DP, 
You have to process states in the order they're calculated. And obviously, smaller length states should be calculated before longer ones. Because before we can calculate, say, is palindrome of one and five, we have to first calculate is palindrome of two and four. Because that's required to solve this one here. So we calculate states in order of their length. So from length zero, length zero means like starting with the same, so actually length one, up to length n. Then we loop over all the states. So we say for each i, then j, the end of the state, is i plus len. So we're going over, this just says for each i, j, for each i, j in order of length. That's what, um, that's, what, that's what that means. We then just say if the length is zero, it's true. That's, that's from before. Back to here. If the length is if the length is one, then it's just starting the same. If length is greater than one, it's just that. That's just again the formula from before. We use some string function to get length of the string, etc. But otherwise, we now know for every string is it a palindrome. Once you've done this, we want to solve the original problem. Remember, the original problem was counting for a given range. How many palindromes are in that range? So a simple solution is just for each query, just check for each range, is it a palindrome? That's n squared per query because for each query, so like let's say we have the string, we're given this substring here. We just check for every substring in that substring, is it a palindrome and count them. This is two, so this is n squared per query, which is too slow. How, how to do better? We do better using DP. And this DP will actually use inclusion exclusion. Why is that? So let's, let's say we're given this string here. And we want to count how many palindromes are in this string here. Well, first of all, we want to check, is this whole thing a palindrome? Because if this whole thing is a palindrome, then we want to add one. So first of all, to check dpij, which is the number of palindromes in the range ij, we first check is palindrome ij. So we first check if, um, et cetera, I can't spell. We first check is this string a palindrome. If it is, we add one to our answer. And that, but then how do we count the, the strings within our string? Well, if we check is dp of this range here, so this is, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So DP of one, seven is equal to, first of all, is palindrome, we add one. So we, if it's true, that's a seven in there. Plus, we, we, wanna, we wanna check, plus, um, we're gonna add DP of one, six. This gives us all the palindromes that start and end in this range here. So we're counting every palindrome except those that, um, except those that include the A at the end. How do that? Well, we're gonna, we're gonna add this range in here. We're gonna add this range here. We're gonna, we're gonna also add on top of that, we're gonna add in green plus DP of two seven, but we've double counted. In particular, every palindrome, which is in this yellow range here, uh, this range here has been counted twice because it's been included once in DP one of six and once DP two of seven. So then we subtract, we go minus DP two six. And now we've counted every palindrome once. We've counted the big palindrome once, and every palindrome that's not the big one has been counted exactly once because we've counted every palindrome in this range, then every palindrome in this range, and then we've subtracted the, the double counting. This is inclusion exclusion, which I think is, you may have seen in, I don't know, 108 one. I think it's in math 108 one. You might not remember it if you've done that course, but yeah, it's called inclusion exclusion. We include stuff and then we exclude double counting. So to write that out kind of formally, so next slide here. 
Uh, let me clear the whiteboard. This is exactly what we were before. So first of all, our, this is our base case. We're just saying if J is less than I, in other words, if our range is like not a valid range, if it's like, a, if it's like a invalid range, we're going to say zero. This makes our code a bit easier to, to do. Otherwise, for, for the answer to the DPI J is just, are we a palindrome plus these two minus some, which is inclusion, exclusion. And that solves this problem. So in code, that looks like this. So we've already calculated is palindrome. We loop over all the links and we just say dpij is equal to is palindrome ij plus this, plus this, minus this. This first case here, because global arrays are zero by default and because our dp array is zero, so global arrays is zero by default, this is all zeros. Um, this case here is already handled for us. Or in this case here, does the first case is done for us? Let's worry about the second case. Um, and so that is this here. And then we answer the queries and the problems. So scanning Q and for each query, we just print out DP L of R, L and R. The time complexity, this is, this is order N squared here. And then each query can be answered in constant time now because we've done what's called pre-computation. So pre-comp, we've already computed the answer to every single state. And we just print the answer here. So the complexity is order N squared plus Q, which is fast enough to solve the problem. And so we have a solution to this problem. And that is the end of the solution to this problem. And in fact, the end of the formal part of this workshop, we move on to the lab section now. So in the lab section, um, join the VJABS group if you haven't already. So go onto this link here, which I'll send in the chat as well to make it very easy for you. Um, so join that group and go to the dynamic programming um, set. This is this one here. That's this context there. So the problems in the set, A plus B problem is not DP. That's just a very simple problem. Do that if you haven't used VJAS before. If you have used VJAS before, ignore that problem. That's just a very simple add two numbers problem. From then on, so if I go to VJAS now, I'm going to quickly switch over to VJAS. Um, here. Um, so we just got VJAS up here. So, um, Go to here. There are problems here. And so A plus B is calculate A plus B. The other ones are like um, frog one. In this problem, you have N stones that want to N. And the, the problem is you have a frog that starts on stone one. It wants to hop to, to, to stone N, but it can only hop at most one stone at a time. And so the question is, what's like the, the cheapest cost to walk to the end? Um, Yep, that's quite similar to our first DP problem. We have now another one, which is another easiest DP problem, but that is um, we haven't seen yet. Then these two here are kind of, these are both harder versions of problems come today. This is a harder version of the grid problem. This is a harder version of another problem from today. And then we have, finally, we have um, the last problem, which is a much harder DP problem for extension, which I'll post a link in the chat. This is kind of an extension problem, which is not on VJudge, but love look at it. If you're really comfortable with DP, it's a much harder problem. Okay. Um, so yeah, we recommend you do A plus B or frog one. Um, submit once you've done it. Um, let us know if you have any questions on that. Both me and I'm going to have to leave in like 10 or so minutes, but Azai will be here for um, the next hour. Um, so he'll be around to answer any questions. Um, yeah, that's all from me if there aren't any questions.
I'm recording. So um, I'll post a link. They'll be in the, so first of all, they'll be in the Facebook group. So in the event, so if you have joined the group, but also more directly, um, I'll get the website link up now um, because that just links to CPM stock. So um, here, on that link here, so at the very bottom, there'll be dynamic programming one, I think it'll be called. It'll be the last dot point here and the recording will be there as well as the slides. That'll be put up probably later today, maybe tomorrow. Um, but yeah, the slides, the code and the um, recording will be put up there probably later today. Oh, good.